Today we're going to talk about what is right, ethics, what is beautiful, aesthetics. Um, I'm actually going to start out spending a few minutes, probably 10 or 15 minutes, finishing out the science lecture because I thought that was very important um, to us. Oh, I just got something out of place here. Hang on a second. Um, I wondered where that, that went. <laughs> now you know. Now I know. We, of course, are talking about philosophy and the, the attempt to think rationally and critically about life's most important questions in order to obtain knowledge and wisdom about them. Now let me start out um, with the end of our philosophy of science lecture. We've been talking about um, naturalism and the idea, naturalism is the belief that the natural world, you know, what we can experience with our senses is all that matters. It's a version of materialism. Uh, materialism says that the, the material world is all that exists. There is nothing else. Which, for a scientist, to, you know, scientists wouldn't say materialism because scientists would say there are abstract things like numbers and, you know, those kinds of things. And so they would talk about more in terms of naturalism. Particularly a naturalist scientist or a philosopher of science who is a naturalist would say that it is inappropriate to bring any theological convictions or beliefs into scientific considerations or practice. All right? That's pretty much when we say scientific naturalism, that's what we're talking about. No theological stuff. There's two kinds of scientific naturalists. The first one are the metaphysical naturalists, which say the physical world is all that exists. They would be materialists. Okay? They would say um, there isn't anything, any supernatural stuff. There's no God, there's no spirit, there's no angels, there's no anything. So don't even talk about it. The other kind of scientific naturalist would be methodological naturalists. Methodological naturalists don't say that, that the supernatural can't exist. In fact, there are some Christians who are methodological, methodological naturalist scientists. They would say that even if the supernatural exists, science should be practiced without reference to any theological concepts. In other words, whether, whether there are theological realities or spiritual realities or not, they shouldn't be brought into science because that's not what science is about. They would say the goal of science is to explain natural phenomena in terms of other natural phenomena, not in terms of any supernatural or theological premises. So those two kinds of naturalists, one doesn't believe in the supernatural, the other one says even if it's there, which it may be, that's not, that has no place in science. We also uh, have a principle called functional integrity, which is a type of met uh, methodological, I have to slow down, methodological naturalism that insists that the cosmos itself, the natural world, has everything that is necessary to explain itself. And even if God created the universe, we don't have to refer to anything gaudy, <laughs> anything about God, in order to understand the, the world, the cosmos, by scientific inquiry. Um, no need to look to God for the explanations. Even if God was involved in it, that's you know, that's out of school. That's not something we should be doing. These questions especially come up in discussions of, of biological origins. When we start talking about, you know, Darwinian natural selection versus um, the, the idea of uh, intelligent design and all those sorts of things. These questions come up right there because intelligent design is obviously an effort to take theological considerations and apply them in a scientific way to the evidence we have for how the world came to be. And naturalist scientists would say that's absolutely inappropriate. So let's look for a second about methodological naturalism. The metaphysical one we don't even need to talk about because they just say, eh, you can't talk about any of those things. So that's pretty straightforward. The methodological naturalism does have one positive, and that is that it prevents the God in the gaps approach, which was dominant in the past. Um, in medieval times, for instance, people who pursued science, whenever they got to something they couldn't explain, they'd go, well, God, God did it. It reminds me of a cartoon I saw once, and these two guys in lab coats, and they've got this board there, and there's all these formulas and scientific, you know, stuff, and then right in the middle it says, and then something really important happens, and then it's got all the rest of the stuff. <laughs> and there's two guys looking at this, and the other guy says, I think you have a problem with the premise right there in the middle. Okay. Well, that's sort of what the God of the Gaps does. It explains everything it can, and then it says, well, God's responsible for the rest of that. And that ends up being bad science, because it ends up being giving it out. Right? That's, and that's not a good thing. That's not something that even a Christian scientist would advocate, 
that we just fall back on that rather than do the hard work. Now, that's actually a positive about methodological naturalism because it doesn't allow us to do that. But the negative is just because errors of this sort, the God in the gaps kind of errors, or the falling back on the supernatural when we, when we haven't done our homework and haven't really worked the problem scientifically, just because it's been done badly in the past does not mean we have to throw the whole thing out. In fact, the principle, and we'll talk about theistic science in just a second, is that we use appropriate discipline even in how we consider the supernatural aspects and that that can be part of the science. This again is one of the principal tenets behind intelligent design as theistic science. The idea of functional integrity, we would have to point out, um, and, and remember, functional integrity says that the cosmos is sufficient to explain itself, you don't need to bring God into it. The problem with that is it's self-defeating because it says you cannot make theological premises part of science, and yet it is a theological premise. It's making a statement about the inappropriateness of God being involved, which is a statement about God as a theological premise. So therefore, it is self-defeating. Um, oh. Why should, and another question we need to ask, and this is a question as Christian philosophers, which you all are now, a question we always need to reasonably ask, and not in a vindictive way, and not in a tossing it off kind of way, but a serious way. Why should we accept function, functional integrity? The idea that you can't bring anything other than natural, um, natural issues into considering the cosmos, that the cosmos explains itself. Who said? Who made that rule? And why should we accept that as just being the given? You know, there is a tendency for a naturalist scientist, and anybody who's, who is naturalistic or materialistic, to say, well, you can't legitimately do that. Well, who says we can't legitimately? Show me the rule book. Um, and so we need to be prepared to, to challenge some of those things. It's simply a matter that the scientific community especially, for the most part, there are Christian scientists, you know, theistic scientists, but for the most part, they have simply said to us that we have to assume, prima facie, on the surface of it, on the face of it, that those things aren't legitimate. But they don't have a right to tell us that. We've got as much right to insist upon an inclusion of supernatural considerations as, as anything else, right? Is that fair? Um, now, further reflections. Some, um, some methodological naturalists who would say you shouldn't bring God into science actually talk about science as a sort of a game. And they say there are certain rules you need to obey because it is a kind of game. And if you violate the rules, then you're not really playing the game. And those rules get violated, especially when you do theological or supernatural considerations. But the, again, the question we need to ask, who says those are the rules? You know, you can say it's a game, meaning, you know, it's a, it's a challenge, we're trying to solve the puzzle kind of thing, which is what science is about. But who says that we have to play it in a particular way that excludes God? There are no written rules about that, right? We have too long, as Christians, believed that Somebody else is in charge, and we have to do it the way they said. Again, I'm not saying that flippantly. I'm not, I'm not accusing. I'm not being negative. I'm just saying, let's just be matter of fact about this. In fact, the, the other thing we need to say is when any scientist, any naturalistic scientist or methodological naturalist, when they say to us, you can't include God because you can't include any supernatural aspects, the fact is that scientists deal with what you could call supernatural aspects all the time. In other words, things that do not occur in the natural world. That's what supernatural means. Things like the principles of logic. Those are abstracts. They do not exist in the natural world. They are a result of rational consideration, but they're not physical, natural things. Uh, mathematics, the very existence of numbers. The laws of thought. You guys remember the laws of thought? Three laws of thought or logic. Abstract concepts like infinity, those things are not part of the natural world. They are, in effect, supernatural, and yet science works with those all the time. They are non concrete aspects that are above nature. And yet, those are okay because they don't have any God words associated with them. And we need to question that. Is that fair? Yep. 
Now, there is a legitimate theistic science. Theistic science that seeks to avoid the God and the gaps errors, which means just using God as an excuse when you haven't figured it out yet, by trying to ensure that an, that, um, an intelligent cause, which we believe to be God, is only appealed to when it is not possible to explain a given phenomena by some natural cause. In other words, you do all the work. You only appeal to the supernatural when it appears as though there's no other explanation. Sherlock Holmes says, when you've considered all, when you've ruled out all the possible answers or explanations, the only remaining explanation, even though it seems impossible, must be the right one. That's pretty much a theistic comment. Thank you, Sherlock. Um, Actually, I could give you from the, from the Sherlock Holmes story some wonderful things. Even though he claimed to be, you know, purely rational and everything else, some wonderful things that talks about his appreciation for the things of God. The challenge that theistic scientists have is to know when they have gone as far as they could. When a phenomena cannot be explained by natural means, and so therefore it is legitimate to start talking about supernatural. When have they avoided the God of the gaps? Uh, problem far enough that it is a legitimate concern. Okay, and that's a very real question. That's a very real concern, and a serious theistic science, scientist has to always be concerned about that. When have they gone far enough that they consider all natural explanations to be exhausted before they consider supernatural or divine? Now, one thing, and this is this is very important. Um, oh wait, hang on. This was all one piece. I am sorry. This, I think, uh, I've got something out of order here. Oh, oh, I'm sorry. Theistic science, let me deal with this page, and then I'll go into the one I thought I was talking about. Theistic science seeks to take theological considerations into account. Alvin Plantinga, should be everybody's hero by now, as often as I've quoted him, he says a very sensible thing. He says the rational thing is to use all you know in trying to understand a given phenomenon. Why limit yourself? For instance, advocates of intelligent design, theistic scientists, would suggest that there are two kinds of biological complexity that only a theistic approach can really address. The first one is the, is the idea of irreducible complexity, which we've talked about. What that means is that there are certain mechanisms, especially biological mechanisms in the world, that are too complex to explain in, in terms of them having occurred one stage at a time. Well, let me explain that. Darwinian evolution by natural selection, which is the basic, with variations, is the basic belief as to how biological life came to be. The principle behind that, the natural selection part, is that through mutation, a biological uh, being, uh, you know, a biology, uh, a person, a, uh, an animal, a thing, a plant, something living, has a mutation that gives it a special new feature. Natural selection says that if that feature is advantageous to survival, then they keep that feature and they reproduce and that feature is passed on. If that feature, that mutation, is not advantageous to survival, then it doesn't contribute to survival and it is deleted, okay? So every adaptation that is retained must show benefit in terms of survival. That's a fundamental principle of evolution by natural selection. Now what that means is, in order, the evolutionary biologists would say that they get, you get one adaptation that's advantageous, and then that leads to another one that's advantageous, and another one that's advantageous, another one, da 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 da, da until eventually you come up with a human eye. But the problem is, in order for that to be true, you have to be able to work backwards and say, what aspect of the human eye, or the flagellum, I talked about the microscopic animals that have this motor that spins, what piece of that could you take away? In other words, what piece would have been the last piece added that still would have provided an advantage, even though it's absent? Okay, you see what I mean? You have to be able to step backwards, and at each stage, you have to be able to, to see there was some advantage. You take any part of the human eye away and the human eye doesn't work. There is no advantage left. You take any piece of the, of the motor capability of a flagellum away and the whole thing stops working. There is no advantage. That's irreducible complexity. 
you can't go from the simplest life form to the very complex life forms in a way that you can explain how that was done in stages, each stage of which gained advantage. Does that make sense? The other is the death is uh, complexity called specified complexity. This refer this is part of the um, fine tuning argument, basically. The idea that there is an aligning of an event with a pattern in such a way that they indicate intentionality that somebody did it on purpose. For instance, the way that the complex sequencing in which in in the DNA molecules the pattern was exactly necessary for human life to occur, which is the event, and you can't back out of that. I mean, to, to a great extent, it's a similar argument, but the idea is the complexity, huge complexity. The unraveling of the DNA chain was, is considered by far the most difficult and significant scientific accomplishment human beings have ever made. That's how complicated it is. And yet, it is in all that complexity, it is exactly what is needed for human life to exist. How does that work? That's what we mean by specify, that things match up, the specifics match up in such a way that they create life or, you know, whatever. So those are examples. Now we'll go on to the slide I thought I was talking about. Theistic science done well seeks to avoid the god of the gaps. The challenge is to know when a given phenomena has been, you've, you've used all possible natural means to explain it, and so therefore it's legitimate to consider theistic, supernatural, divine means. A critically important point is that theistic science is open to all evidence that is found through scientific inquiry. God, for instance, could have used evolution in creation. That's very possible. A lot of very evangelical, very conservative Christian scientists would say evolution works, but only if you believe God was doing it, that God was intentional in using it. On the other hand, so, so theistic science, if done well and maturely, can, look at, can consider any possibility. But naturalistic science, methodological naturalistic science, can't. They can never, by definition, they can never even consider any non-natural explanation. They are inherently more limited in what options they can consider than are theistic scientists. And, by, and I think by definition, that's bad science. When you start out with the presumption that some things cannot even be looked at or considered. To that extent, theistic science is actually a better kind of science than naturalistic science. You see why? Okay. That's the end of the science talk. Any questions about any of that? The theistic uh, science that has that been much more... Um Acceptable now, like in say the last 30 or 40 years? Or Very much it, so. Like, has that been the last 30 or 40 or 50 years when it's really start coming out strong? Yes, I would say probably starting in the mid 20th century, probably the 60s or 70s. And what happened is as science has proceeded, like the fine tuning you know, um, example, the fine tuning explanation for God, the more that science has learned, the more honest scientists have said, I'm sorry, but we can't explain that by anything other than intentionality, which implies a person, and a person that is sufficiently powerful to create and maintain the universe, that by definition is God. And so more and more and more, honest scientists have been coming to the point of saying, everything we are learning is telling us there must be a God. And so there is, and, and therefore, you get people like Michael Behe and uh, Francis Collins, who was the director of the Human Genome Project, is a Christian. You know, and he's one who says, and he, and he maintains evolution, he's one of the ones, but he would say there's no way to explain this unfathomable complexity and the perfection with which it provides the potential of life. Not only human life, but there's DNA for all biological life, um, without believing there is some intention behind it. And so more and more and more, you get people who are saying that. And they're far smarter and far better, far better writers than the Dawkinses and Hitchenses of the world, trust me. Um, Lynn person. Just, just to sort of put it in time perspective for Chris, um, I was in high school in the 60s and had a physics and chemistry teacher who was an amazing man, but a profound Christian, okay. a, a real Christian. And he said, 
you are better scientists and you are a better Christian than the two are together. Right. He said they're, they're not separate. <clears throat> exactly. Mark? Uh, I'm completely awed by the millions of insects and animals and plants that all are so different from one another. And, you know, somebody says they all crawl up the ooze at one point. And, and in something like the monarch butterfly that takes four generations to go from Canada to Mexico and back again, I, how does that evolve? You know, right. There's, there's got to be some. They're passing the map off. Okay, let's talk about ethics. It, is your camera on? It is. It's been running the whole time. I right. checked it beforehand. Carolyn. Okay, good. Yeah, her clients set up a call at this time, but she starts the camera and then she goes takes the call. And, for um, and then we're going to make her watch the videos. <laughs> <laughs> All right, let's talk about ethics. This is my transition screen. Um, the question, the philosophy of ethics is what is right? In other words, as opposed to wrong. Question that's asked in the book, which I really like, and they use Woody Allen's Crimes and Misdemeanors as an example, is if you knew you could get away with a very profitable crime, you could get away with it scot-free, you were guaranteed, you were not going to get caught, would you do it? It brings us to the real question, what, what is right? Okay. Does it mean not being able to get caught? I actually had a conversation that, uh, with somebody one night. There were several of us from church, and there's a couple that we know in town. And we were talking about the new banking laws here in Mexico. And this fellow kept saying, you know, he had investments here, and bank here, and he said, well, you know, I'm not worried about because they can't catch me. And another person who's elder in our church and I were saying, yeah, but you know, the real issue is whether you get away with it or not, is it right? He went, well, the whole point is they can't catch me. There's no way they can find out. And we said, yes, but you have to ask, is it morally right? And he said, what are you talking about? They can't catch me. He was absolutely uh, in, unable to consider that the issue of a moral right or wrong was based upon anything except whether or not he was going to get caught and punished for it. And if he's not going to get caught and punished, as far as he was concerned, there was not a question. Yeah. Drove me crazy. <laughs> Right. I have an issue with that because um, if we're told that something is right because the government decides that it's going to be to their best interests and not the best interests of the people, then I don't see that as being right. Okay, well I do because it's a law. Why and we, no, it's we not are, a law by a democratic means. We are, yes it is. It was voted into law in Mexico. The government of the United States are the ones that told them they had to do it. But we're getting off into a specific issue. The, the issue of obedience to the law, there's the question. Is that, is obedience to the law morally right or is it not? The book raises some questions like, and now pay attention to this, because it really is the issue of if the Nazis are in control and they show up at your door and there are Jews hiding in your basement, do you turn them over? Some, some philosophy of ethics would say, yes, you do. Because not lying is a higher value than almost anything else. Huh, for instance, higher value than life? Well, exactly. Some would say that. I'm not saying I say that, okay. but Kant, for instance, said you cannot, you cannot make a moral decision that you can't universalize to every circumstance and accept the consequences. And mm -hmm. Kant would say if you lie about that and tell the Nazis, no, there are no Jews here, then you are saying it would be okay for everyone to lie about everything, including to you. And Kant would say, you're not prepared to do that, and so therefore you shouldn't lie about that. You should turn the Jews in. Now, we would say that's that's nuts, right? But that's why this is this is an issue, because people have disagreed with it. Okay? To me, the example I'm giving is his whole thing was I can't get caught, so therefore there is no question. Bob? Seems to me these are all moral dilemmas. Why does moral rise? Well, that's exactly why we, the, the Jewish, uh, my Jewish friend, when we invited him to come to the Easter service and we, we give him pancakes and bacon, he went, oh, the Jewish dilemma, free bacon. <laughs> it is, but that's exactly why it's an issue. Because the point here, and we'll get into that, is exactly how do you deal with what appears to be a dilemma? And you have to choose. So let's talk about it. What is right? Or is it the thing that brings the most benefit to me? Some say it is. 
my friend who said I can't get caught, that's the way he thinks. Is it the thing that brings the most benefit to other people, so that there's an aspect of self-sacrifice? And Rand says, absolutely not. That's stupid. And Rand is stupid. <laughs> and not a writer either, if you read That's why she shrugged. Yeah, that's <laughs> um, is it is what is right the thing that brings the most benefit to the most people? All right. Other questions. What does it mean to act morally, and what are our motives for doing so? Not getting caught? To help somebody else? To help myself? To help my children at the expense of someone else's children? How far should we or will we go to act morally and do what is right, even if the results are very unpleasant? Will I sacrifice myself for a stranger? Would I jump in front of a truck for somebody I don't know? How do I decide that? See, that's the whole point, Bob, and your point that these are dilemmas is, how do we decide it? That's why there's a philosophy of ethics, is to try to give us some way of thinking about this. And in fact, if all of our understanding, everything we're studying, all of our logic, epistemology, metaphysics, human nature, and, and our study of God himself, if it doesn't translate into better living, to some extent, what good is it? Now, I disagree with the book. The book says ethics is the most important for that reason, that ethics is the most important study or aspect of philosophy. I don't agree. Because if we don't have our, you know, as a Christian, I don't agree. Because if we don't have a correct philosophy of God, if we don't have a correct understanding of the nature of being, metaphysics, or how we know things, epistemology, then we're not going to get as far as ethics. <laughs> um, that it is a, it's a consequent study rather than a primary study, if you see what I mean. Now, yes, it is a goal. It's a, it's a significant goal. But I would not go so far as the authors of this book and say it's the, the primary philosophy. Yes? That means the guy that says, I can't get caught. You gotta say to God knows. You're well, already caught. <laughs> exactly. You know, that, and, and, and see, you get into an issue there. Is there a moral consequence beyond even what we're able to see? That's another one of the questions, especially for Christians. So, what is right? The problem is, as Bob just observed, there are sometimes, it's sometimes difficult to discern what course of action is best. We sometimes find ourselves caught in what appears to be a dilemma. Because we can have what seem to be conflicting truths. How do we discern the moral truth involved? What principles might there be to guide us in moral decision making? That's what the philosophy of ethics is. It's an effort to try to come up with some principles that allow us to think well about these things in order to make the right decisions. Or the most right decisions. In some cases, the dilemmas are such that there is no perfect decision. In fact, Aquinas came up with what he called the, you know, the, the principle of the double, you know, the double consequent that we'll look at that actually identifies the fact that when you've got, no matter what you do, something evil is going to happen, how do you decide? How do you decide between the things? Um, is there even such a thing as moral truth? With a capital T, I should have made that. Is morality rather just a matter of opinion or of emotions? These are all the questions that philosophy of ethics deal with. What role does religious belief properly play in ethics? Is it just a matter of thinking, well, if we do the wrong thing, God is going to judge us for that? Or are there other issues that religious conviction come into play? So the philosophy of ethics seek to uh, confront the need to find some kind of connection between ethical theory, what we believe is right, and ethical practice, when we actually have to make a decision, what am I going to do in this case? Because many times in ethical situations, the, the morality of it is not clear. Because we will find what seem to be conflicting moral objectives. And one way or the other, you're going to violate something you consider to be a moral truth. Okay, Terry, yes, first. I'll give a, it's not a question, but a real live example where this came into years back when we were in Uganda and I think we saw somebody that had been injured along the road and there were people gathering and we kind of drove by and later John and I had a big discussion about whether we should stop or not mm -hmm. and so we asked a lot of people and even even pastors said no no don't stop because you'll be captured and they'll blame you for the accident and all of this right and yet it was a moral dilemma what should we have done so I, maybe 
later today we'll have some we'll figure that out figure it out yeah <laughs> i won't you won't get an answer from this but you may get a process that right. you can go through yeah we right. struggled a lot bob well if there are two right things to do and you choose one of the right things are you then wrong because you didn't choose the other right thing that's the exactly. same logic that's the dilemma that's exactly it um and let me give you some examples of the kinds of things we do believe that there appear to be certain common sense principles about ethical decision making and morality such as the principle of autonomy the idea that people should be allowed to be self-determining we for instance don't advocate slavery because that's taking away self-determination from someone you know we as a western culture don't readily advocate arranged marriages where people have to marry somebody whether they want to or not etc etc the idea of self-determination or self-autonomy the principle of utility to maximize pleasure and minimize pain and by that i don't mean you know there's certain kind of pleasures that wouldn't fit under this as a as an ethical principle not sadistic pleasure for instance or the infliction you know of, of pain there's an assumption in this that there is a right a right mindedness you know about I mean, the healthiness when we talk about as a background of this the principle of justice that all people should be treated fairly and equally the principle of sanctity of life, respect for that all life is sacred. All right? Can you see a conflict just from these principles I put up here? Which I think everybody would look at and go, yes, that's that's a moral principle that we would, you know, we'd say it's a good idea. Can you pick out, can you give me an example where in our modern culture where there's a difficulty with this? What happens when the sanctity of life confronts the principle of autonomy and people's right to be self-determining? Or should abortions be illegal or legal? They're legal because the determination that the decision, the legal decision was made that the right of a woman to have control over her own body to be self-determining trumped the issue of the life of a fetus. And obviously that's a huge moral problem right now for a lot of people. So the issue is when you've got two or more ethical principles that seem to be in conflict, how do you resolve it? What is a process? That's what the philosophy of ethics is all about. It is an effort to seek an ethical theory or general framework that will assist us. It won't be perfect, but it will assist us in making better ethical decisions. You see that? Okay, Pam first. There's religions that would absolutely say no to all of this. Um, Muslims do not respect uh, the life of, and do not treat people fairly and equally. That's not true. Okay, I, I teach classes on Islam, and that's actually not true. There is a radical form of Islam okay. that could probably be described that way. Okay, and you're right. It, the radical is what I'm talking right. about because they just murdered that lawyer. Absolutely. That was, was, went to her home, tortured her for five days and murdered her. There was Absolutely. No, no, and she just put some rational things on Facebook. Yeah. And she was murdered. So and, and that's I, what I'm thinking. Yeah, and there are certainly examples of that. But whenever we talk about this, about the madness of the extremist Islamists like ISIL, yeah. um, I remind people of a little event called Jim Jones and the People's Temple in yes. Guyana. Yeah. Guyana. Yeah. Have we as Christians not also had our extreme craziness yes. sometimes? Mm -hmm. And yet we don't want to be you know, black tarred with that same brush. I don't believe Islam is correct. Don't misunderstand me. I believe Christianity is correct. But we have to be fair about this stuff. Bob? Well, with respect to abortion, <clears throat> I'm personally opposed to abortion. This was a choice that I had to make in my professional life. Right. But here's an interesting question. If you assume that the fetus has a soul or a spirit... Okay, I don't really want to get drawn into a specific argument on this. We're dealing with the principles, Bob. Or could we would spend all day on it. Is that fair? Okay. Okay, I'm sorry to cut you off, but we got a lot to cover, and we could we could pick out. I'm, I try to give examples, but we could get we could start digging into the details of those examples, and we could take all day on that. Um, but the, but the point is, I mean, you you made a moral choice in terms of where you stood on it as a position. Other people obviously make other choices. What do they base that on, or is it just going along with the crowd? Okay, so let's talk about philosophy of ethics, ethical theories. Not only, and I said ethical theory is what we're looking for, in other words, some sort of overriding understanding of how we approach this. Ethical theory is not only aimed to prioritize moral principles, like I gave you four moral principles there, 
But they also need to tell us the meaning of moral terms, concepts, and priorities. That is the role of philosophy. One of the first responsibilities of philosophy is to help define terms, so we all know what we're talking about. Um, every ethical theory asks what does it mean to make a moral judgment, such as honesty is good or Osama bin Laden is bad. What does it mean to do that? And based on what? There are some people who thought Osama bin Laden was a hero. There are some cultures in which honesty, if it's at, the, at your own expense, is not considered a good thing. That's a fact. All right? Um, moral theories aim to tell us the real meaning. Again, part of the role, one of the roles of philosophy is definition. Of such terms as duty, right, obligation, justice, and virtue. That theoretical concept approach to ethics, the definition of those big terms, is what's known as meta-ethics. Above ethics. It's, it's the theoretical stuff. But then we get into what's called normative ethics, which is the practical implications and applications of moral theory. So meta-ethics is when we decide theoretically what, what do we believe to be true and how do we define things. In. But then normative is how do we then put that into practice. Let me give you an example. Is having a driver's license in the US or Canada is that a right to have a driver's license? No. It's a privilege. It's a privilege. What's the difference? A right is something that you cannot justly deny someone. A privilege is something that someone has to qualify for. They have to meet certain criteria, right? Yes. Is voting a right or a privilege? It's a privilege. Felons can't vote in most states. They're citizens. You know, some, now, in some states, some states, yeah. they have voting in prison. Yeah. Yeah. Some states, felons have to appeal to the governor to get the right to vote again. Some can only vote after they have, you know, been released. No parole, no charges, you know, everything's cleaned up. Some places, a convicted, some states, a convicted felon cannot vote. We assume voting is a right, but there are criteria in many cases that have to be met before a person who is a convicted felon, for example, is allowed to vote. So can it be called a right? If there are qualifications? That, those are ethical questions. So one of the most basic ethical questions when we start talking about developing an ethical theory is, is there absolute moral truth? Meaning, moral values that are true for everyone, at all times, in all places, regardless of culture or personal preference. Is there an absolute moral truth? Is it always wrong to boil and eat your children? You think so? They're teenagers. <laughs> Some people might say, or two. You know, terrible two. Okay. Now there's two approaches to this question of, is there absolute moral truth? There are moral objectivists who say that there are universal moral standards. In other words, they think that's an objective reality. It doesn't, doesn't matter what you think about it or what anybody thinks about it, it's an objective reality. Moral objectivists. There are, or is, a universal moral truth. Then there are moral, or sometimes called ethical, relativists. Those are the people who deny that there are any such thing as universal moral standards or a, a universal moral truth. Those are the two categories. Either you believe there's a universal standard, you're a moral objectivist. You don't believe that there is a universal moral standard and you are a moral relativist or ethical relativist. Let's talk about the second one first. Ethical or moral relativism. This is a view that there are no universally true moral values. Okay. Now, um, there are several ways to go about this, but let's, let's ask the question, if ethical relativism is correct, then what is the meaning of moral judgments, such as honesty is good or adultery is wrong, if there's no such thing as any absolute or objective moral truths? Adultery is wrong, unless you really love the person. <laughs> right? That's moral relativism. If you say, if you laugh and go, no, then you obviously think there is some objective moral value associated with that. Okay? Now, according to the relativists, the answer 
is that any statement that we make, like honesty is good or adultery is wrong, simply reflects, in one way or another, the preferences that people have expressed. People have decided that it's better to say this, not because there's some objective truth, but because this is advantageous either to the culture they live in or to them as an individual. And that reflects the two kinds of moral relativism. There is cultural relativism, and there is moral subjectivism. Subjective, anytime you hear subjective or subject, subjectivism, it means it's what I think. I'm the subject. Object is the thing outside you, objectivism. Subject is me, and so I decide. So cultural relativism or moral subjectivism are the two versions of ethical relativism. Let's talk about those. Um, well, that's interesting. Um, cultural relativism, that's the first of the two categories of ethical relativism. It's the view that the key to understanding moral convictions is the culture in which the, the question is raised. Anthropologists, a number of anthropologists that have studied tribal groups, primitive peoples, etc., have come back and said that, that given the difference in what's considered normal in different cultures, calling behavior habitual, meaning this is how they do it, is the same as calling it morally good for that people. You know, if they have, if they have a culture in which cross-dressing is the norm, then they would consider that morally good because people accept it and they do it. Um, or where stealing is considered the norm uh, in, in East Africa. Folks who have experience with Africa. In East Africa, there are several different tribes in Kenya and in the areas of East Africa that hold as part of their belief system that God had given them all the cattle on the earth. That that is their birthright. That their tribe Karamoja, for instance, or others, that their tribe owns all the cattle. So therefore, it is quite normal for them to steal the cattle of a neighboring tribe. And that tribe, who believes that they have a you know, divine right to all the cattle in the world, will come back and steal them back. And this has been going on for thousands of years. And it was all very well and good until Idi Amin got thrown out of power, and all of a sudden there were a lot of automatic weapons floating around East Africa. And some of the tribes were armed. And they started using automatic weapons to steal all the cattle, and it no longer was a matter of, you know, clubs and spears. Changed the whole game. And then some missionaries had the challenge, do we arm the other guys? So it's at least fair again? Okay? So anthropologists would say that the normal practices in a culture are by definition good, even if they're things we look at and go, wow, how's that okay? They would say that what begins in a culture as simply advantageous patterns of thought and behavior. By stealing the other guy's cattle, then we have the cattle. That's an advantage for us. It starts that way initially, but then over time it develops into the standard of what is right and wrong in a culture, or the mores. Okay? M-O-R-E-S is pronounced mores. That term was, quote, was um, created by an anthropologist to define or describe the developed um, beliefs of what is right and wrong over time in the culture. Now, to put it another way, cultural relativism can be summarized as what's called in what's called the plurality agreement. That is, one, moral values differ from culture to culture. Now, some of us would say superficial moral values, but there, there are some moral values that don't change. I don't think we've ever found a culture that believed it was okay to kill and boil and eat your own children. So where's the line? But anyway, anthropologists say moral values differ from culture to culture, and secondly, therefore, as, a, as an argument, there is no objective moral standard, because they're different in different places. But we have to observe the fact that just because there are multiple perspectives on any given topic, ethical, scientific, anything else, just because there are different views on it doesn't mean there isn't a right view somewhere. Difference of opinion does not necessarily mean that there's not a right answer or even difference of habit or mores. Besides which, we have to say if cultural relativism, that is whatever culture decides is, is okay, is true, and in fact it's good, it's morally good for them to do whatever they do because that's what they do, if that's true, then there are no grounds for ever criticizing any cultural institution. 
we would have to say in that case, cannibalism is fine, slavery is good with me, child prostitution, which is practiced in some cultures, is okay, female genital mutilation, perfectly acceptable, according, according to cultural relativism. Not only that, not only could we never, according to cultural uh, relativism, could we ever critical, be critical of any cultural habits or, or practices, but any moral progress would not be possible because by definition they would say, what you're doing now is fine. You don't have to do anything any different. You, you can't get better because where you are is just fine now. So moral progress or improvement is not possible. And every major figure that has ever been a moral reformer, William Wilberforce in, trying, in getting rid of slavery in the British Empire, <clears throat> Mahatma Gandhi in addressing the inequities of, of British uh, of control of India, uh, the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King who opposed the, you know, the uh, oppression of African Americans in the United States, they were all terrible people because they didn't have the good sense to know that since cultures they were working in had accepted those things, then they therefore were morally good and they should have left them alone. And the weird part about cultural relativism is once somebody like Wilberforce was successful in ending the slave trade and then, and then the whole slavery practice, and, and then the more of the culture was against slavery and only after he was successful would he be considered a good guy, not a bad guy. Because then the moray of the culture had changed in that regard. See what I mean? It simply doesn't work. We cannot believe cultural relativism. That does not mean we don't respect the fact that different cultures have different habits, practices, and to the extent that they don't constitute what we consider moral issues, we being anybody else, I'm sorry, but there is a very small percentage of the world that believes that female genital mutilation is acceptable. Okay, for an example. And so for the rest of us to be able to say, I'm sorry, but we're going to work against that because we don't think that's right. So, that is cultural relativism. That's one aspect of ethical relativism. The second aspect is moral subjectivism. Here we're not talking about what a culture decides is, is right or moral or whatever, but rather what individual people think, what I think. Moral subjectivism says that what, what is right is whatever I decide is right, what I think is right. Just like uh, cultural relativism, moral subjectivism denies the existence of any universal truth. It is what I think it is, moral truth. But again, there are problems with this, and I'm, I'm giving you sort of quickies on this stuff because we don't have as much time as I'd like, but if moral subjectivism is true, I just gave you the problems with cultural relativism, if moral subjectivism is true, then no one can ever be declared incorrect in their personal moral judgments. We have no grounds of ever being critical of somebody's moral choice if we really believe that morality is a subjective, entirely subjective issue. Rapists, serial killers, pornographers, child slavers, white slavers, if they think it's right, then we have to agree with them. Like right. There can be no debate on ethical issues ever of any kind if we truly believe in moral subjectivism. Really? Are we, are we prepared to buy that? And yet some people maintain that. That it's right if I think it's right. If it feels good, do it. I mean, there are a lot of manifestations of this. Why deny yourself if that's what you want? That's moral subjectivism. And people don't think about drawing that to a logical conclusion. That there can be no morality if we maintain moral subjectivism of any kind. No ethics of philosophy at all. It destroys everything. Okay? Another as, uh, version of uh, ethical relativism is called emotivism. Emotivism is an effort to try to apply the principle of, of verification, or the verification principle, that the logical positivists, the, the Vienna group um, in the early 1800s, they were trying to turn everything into science. The verification principle says that nothing can be true or real unless it can be empirically verified, in other words, by experimentation. So the emotivism, 
says that because no ethical statements can be empirically, experimentally, scientifically verified, you know, honesty is good, murder is wrong, there's no scientific way to demonstrate that that's true, right? And so therefore the verification principle can apply. Therefore, the logical positivists, the emotivists, would say that those statements, moral statements, have no cognitive content, that they're merely expressions of feelings. It doesn't feel good to me when somebody kills my friend. It's not that it's wrong, it just doesn't feel good. So emotivism therefore denies moral statements as having any real meaning or any true value they're simply emotional outbursts. When, and the, the book talks about the fact that the, to the emotivist, when we say that honesty is good, it's sort of like saying, yay, honesty! <laughs> I feel good about that! And there's no cognitive or value meaning behind that. But if that's true, there simply can't be any normative motive, moral standards according to emotivism, because it's not possible for us to have any rational consideration of any ethical questions. We can't be having this conversation about ethics if emotivism is right, because they're just emotional outbursts and we can't talk rationally about it. See why nobody really liked the logical positivists? <laughs> nobody brags about being one anymore? Because uh, it doesn't work in any way. Then we come to the joy of the world, nihilism. Nihilism is the view that life is meaningless. Period. Um, it comes out of a rejection of all metaphysics, meaning we can know what's real in the world, a rejection of God, and a complete rejection of the Western theistic, dominant theistic worldview. The, the primary, the, the prophet of nihilism is Friedrich Nietzsche. Nietzsche proclaimed that God is dead. Now, when he said that, he wasn't meaning literally God is dead as though he were alive and now he's not anymore. Nietzsche was observing that the Western world no longer believes in God, therefore he doesn't exist. And he expressed it as God is dead. And if God is dead, if there's no longer a belief in God, then therefore there can be no moral values, because there's no foundation for them. And, quoting Dostoevsky's observation about nihilism, everything is permitted. No God, no meaning, no metaphysics, no values, no moral principles. Go for it. Whatever you want. Everything is permitted. That's the logical conclusion that you get to from nihilism. Now, Nietzsche and the other nihilists, however, were faced with a challenge when they said life was meaningless, metaphysics doesn't exist, there is no God, etc. And that is, how do you get out of bed in the morning? How do you find some kind of meaning in what they have decided is a meaningless world? And so they had to try to find ways to create a sense of value in life when there, weren't, there wasn't any value or any values any longer. In fact, the nihilistic problem, and the book observes this very correctly, is that it is not, it's not survivable. Almost every nihilist has come to the point of either committing suicide, I mean every philosophical nihilist, committing suicide or advocating suicide but admitting they were too scared to do it, or like Friedrich Nietzsche, spending the last number of years of his life and he died young in a mental institution. Mm. It will make you crazy or it will cause you to kill yourself or else to mourn the fact that you haven't gone crazy or don't have the strength to kill yourself. Yay, nihilism. <laughs> okay. That's why we don't teach that. We're not, you're not going to see a class here on nihilism, and it's a, you know, so. Existentialism, which is unfortunately related to nihilism in some ways, because existentialism is the way that some of the nihilists tried to find that meaning we said that they didn't exist. Existentialism is the view that human beings don't have a fixed nature, but rather our nature develops or evolves over time as we experience life, or as we exist. That's where existentialism comes from. As we exist, as we go through the process of existing and living life, our natures evolve, and we change based upon the experiences we have. Because of that, if we're, if we're intentional about it and paying attention, we can define ourselves and our own destinies, and in doing so, create a sense of meaning and a sense of purpose. You see why the nihilists went this direction? 
I can create a sense of meaning, meaning by directing my life in the direction I want to go because I don't think that there's any meaning outside of what I put into it. Now, there's two kinds of existentialists, very important to know. Some of them are the atheistic uh, existentialists. Nietzsche, um, Camus, Albert Camus, uh, Jean-Paul Sartre, hell is other people, you know, Sartre's uh, No Exit uh, play, where he quotes hell is other people. Really cheery guy. They took the same, they were nihilists, and existentialism in this, um, in this form or type takes the same root as the nihilists, trying to find meaning and find value for themselves by trying to exist in such a way as to create it because it's not really there. And as I say, most of them are horribly depressed and depressing people. A lot of suicide on that side, or mental institutions. The other version of this are theistic existentialists, people who believe in God and yet still believe that by God's will, we develop our natures as we go along by how we live our lives, how we exist. Um, Soren Kierkegaard, Gabriel Marcel, and Martin Buber, you know, some very significant theologians. Kierkegaard was an existentialist. In fact, atheistic, atheistic existentialists study Soren Kierkegaard and just sort of turn a blind eye to the fact that the guy was a Christian. He was a, he was a depressing Danish Christian. Sorry, Carolyn. Hey. Um, <laughs> I, I mean, I tell you, you know, um, one of his books that we, that we studied, the course I took, was called Sickness Unto Death. <laughs> if, and I have put the challenge out there. I will give $1,000 to anybody who can read the first page of Sickness of the Death and tell me they really understand what it means. Okay? It is the most difficult, turgid writing ever. Okay? And yet, their emphasis, as opposed to trying to create, you know, sort of out of myself, drum up, drum up some kind of meaning, like the atheistic existentialists, they took the approach that our need to experience life, according to God's will, meant approaching God through radical faith. Kierkegaard was famous for talking about faith being a blind leap into the dark, that we just sort of close our eyes and cast ourselves out into the abyss and, and trust that God's going to catch us. Because there's no rational kind of justification for it. There's no, there's no meaning or values. Apart from the existence of God, and other than that, you just have to throw yourself on His on His mercy, you know, in a way that's way that's that's counter rational, you know, that's against reason. Francis Schaeffer, and I, I talked about this in one of the classes. Francis Schaeffer has a, an appropriate correction to Kierkegaard, and that is, yes, faith is a leap of faith, but it is an informed leap of faith, because God has spoken to us in Scripture. He has spoken to us by the Holy Spirit and the history of the Church. So that while we do jump off into the darkness of the abyss, we do so after having been instructed as to the fact that God is there, He loves us, He cares for us, He will catch us. Not blind and irrational. Okay? So, existentialism is another kind of ethical relativism. Let's take a seven minute break. We're talking about um, ethical relativism. Let's talk about ethical objectivism. This is the other side of it. The belief that there is a, there is a universally true ethical standard a moral code that applies to every person. It's not just what a culture says or what a person thinks, but there are moral truths, moral standards. The belief that moral statements have a truth value that are completely independent of cultural practices, individual preferences, or human emotions, like emotivism. Okay? Now, that means that when a person says something like stealing is wrong or giving to charity is good, they are making a judgment about the act itself not simply about the cultural or personal attitude or response to that act. Do you see the importance of that? When I say stealing is wrong, I'm not saying I don't like it. I'm not saying our culture has said it's wrong. I'm saying it is wrong. There is something inherently wrong with that. So the act itself is being identified or described in a moral statement according to Moral objectivism. Now, moral objectivism, and this is one of the ones we're winning on, is today and has always been the dominant view of ethical philosophers. There is, it is only a minority of people who are involved in philosophy of ethics who would maintain and are, would really maintain a um, a moralistic, a moral, an ethical relativism. Now, 
culture does because people don't like to be told if I want it, I, maybe I shouldn't get it because it's wrong. If I want it, I want it. Okay? Our culture doesn't like the idea there may be objectively things that are right or wrong. Well, if I can't get caught, there's not an issue. But philosophers, people who think about this stuff, almost all of them are um, moral objectives. So, if it's true that there are objective moral standards, what is that universal moral standard? Or what are those standards? And from where does it come? What is the standard if there is one? Where do we get it? It didn't just appear out of nowhere, did it? Or did it? There are two approaches to answering that question. Where does it come from and what is that standard? First, there are naturalistic ethical theories that propose that the universal moral standard is found inherently in human aspects, either our, the, the natural facts, human self-interest, the desire for pleasure, human rationality, that it occurs there naturally. That yes, it's objective, it's true for all people, but it's not supernatural in any way, it's natural. Okay. The other approach to ethical objectivism is called non-naturalistic ethical theories. And I really hate that name because it makes it sound unnatural. <laughs> and that's not what it is. But these non-naturalistic ethical theories claim that moral standards transcend the natural world. They don't come out of human rationality or anything we can identify as existing in the world. They come from somewhere else. Aliens? <laughs> no, I don't think anybody proposes that one. But, you know, from somewhere else. Let's talk about ethical naturalism, the naturalistic ethical theories. First, under the naturalistic ethical theories, that is the idea that ethics occur naturally but are, you know, are objective. Ethical egoism, not egotism, Although in Ayn Rand's case, I think that might be applicable. <laughs> Ethical egoism is the belief that one's basic moral duty is always to act in one's own self-interest. That that's inherent in people, and that it's right to be selfish. You remember Gordon Gekko? Good. Greed is good. Greed works. He could have been quoting Atlas Shrugs. Yes. Because one of the primary popular advocates of this is Ayn Rand. Um, in Atlas Shrugs, and other books of hers, and she's a pitifully bad writer, I believe. She says that human beings and our existence is an end to itself. That whatever best enables human beings to survive is our ultimate guide in ethics. Whatever helps me survive is good. Whatever limits my ability to survive or flourish is bad. Greed is good. Rand praises human competition, and she denounces altruism and self-sacrifice as counterproductive. That it's bad to do something charitable for someone. That, if, that competition is what makes us better. Competition is what makes us stronger. That's what Gordon Gekko was saying in that movie. Okay? And the movie was... Wall Street. Wall, Wall, Street. Wall Street. Michael Douglas says that. Um, a version of this is psychological egoism, which says that, that human beings always, psychologically, inherently pursue their own self-interest. That we always do what we want. And I've heard that, for instance, when people say, you know, oh, I hate my job. Well, you know what? That's your fault, because people do what they really want to do. That's psychological egoism. And Rand's moral theory, we need to understand, is a direct adaptation of Darwinian, both Darwinian theory of natural selection, and also the capitalistic idea of ethics, the greed is good kind of thing. Darwin said, the strong survive. Survival of the fittest. And Rand converts that into competition being good. The better whatever wins. And that's how it should be. Because it contributes to survival. Now, remember, this is an ethical conversation. <laughs> She believes that this is how you determine what is ethically good, not just, you know, profitable, but ethically good. Now, there's problems with that. Contrary to what Anne Rand says, when she says two people, you know, competing, you know, whoever's strongest will win, and that will, that's beneficial. 
She doesn't matter, happen to point out the fact that in any competition between two people or two companies or anything else, somebody loses. And so, yeah, it may be an you know, it may be a moral good to the one who wins, according to her own definition, but according to her own definition, it's not a moral good to the one who loses, who doesn't get the job, is the example in the book, or you know, gets beat up, or whatever else it is. And the get beat up part. Um, the idea of this ethical egoism is fundamentally unjust because it says that whatever I believe is in my best interest is morally right if I'm strong enough to have it happen. And so therefore, Ayn Rand's ethical egoism supports the strong over the weak, those in power over the oppressed, it, and it can encourage things like slavery. Slavery, after all, is those who were in power taking advantage of those who weren't in power. Dictatorships. I've got the guns. You know, might is right. The golden rule. He who has the gold rules. Bullying or any other example where someone who has more power or authority or whatever oppresses someone else. That's all considered morally good according to Ayn Rand. Yes? So would that apply to individuals or organizations or nations? Uh, all the above. In fact, Adolf Hitler could have written this book. <laughs> or Joseph Stalin. Uh, 80 million people, plus or minus a few million. What does that matter as long as I'm in power and the things I believe are good are winning? You see the problem with that? It's also true that ethical egoism defies any common sense evaluation. I mean, who would say that altruism, that is generosity and charity, are bad? Or that self-sacrifice is really stupid? Really? She's the only one that had the unmitigated gall to say something as ridiculous as that. That I know of. By the way, don't read those books. And ran. Don't worry. Mark her off. But she was incredibly popular. Oh yeah, she still is. And you know why she's incredibly popular? The very few people who understand exactly what she's saying and agree with her, like her, and the people who read it and, and don't aren't really motivated to or able to think deeply about it go, I think there must be something here. And yet they don't realize the consequences of what she's advocating. Besides which, on her own principles. How can we even know what actions today are going to contribute to my long-term self-interest or your long-term self-interest? Or whose self-interest are we focused on here? If, he's talking, if she's talking about a culture or a nation, it's whoever is apparently in charge. And if somebody else is strong enough you know, to shoot the one in charge out of the saddle and take over, then that must be good, according to her ideas. So that's ethical egoism. And Anne Rand, and she's dead. We then have, not that I have opinions about this. <laughs> <laughs> well, Chris, you said you liked it when I expressed opinions about this. <laughs> I try to be fair and balanced and tell you honestly what they say. Um, utilitarianism. This is another way of approaching ethical naturalism. Remember the idea that we have a natural something that tells us what's right and wrong. Utilitarianism is based upon, and it's based upon the ancient philosophy of hedonism, um, or Epicureanism addresses this, the belief that ethical choices can and should be made based upon the pursuit of pleasure and the avoidance of pain. Now, pleasure here doesn't mean sexual pleasure necessarily or anything else, other than the fact that the things that I find good and satisfying, how do I feel about it? If it's pleasurable to me, more of that. If it's painful or negative to me, or I don't like it, less of that. That's utilitarianism. There, and it is usually spoken of in terms of hedonism, which again is the, the hedonism is the pursuit of pleasure. That's what that means. And it was the principle behind ancient Epicureanism. This goes all the way back to the Greeks. Psychological hedonism is the claim that, as a matter of fact, all human beings seek pleasure. You remember psychological egoism was the idea that all human beings you know, seek their own good. So it's, these two are parallel to each other, that it's inherent in our psychology. To seek good, that's psychological egoism, or to seek pleasure, psychological hedonism. 
There's a, a, a different version of hedonism, which is ethical hedonism, which says that the thesis is, uh, that is that pleasure is the highest human good. The first part, psychological hedonism, all it says is that I'm going to go for that. Ethical hedonism actually makes an ethical statement and says that pleasure is good, that it has a positive value beyond the fact that I want it. And there is the principle of utility. This is the suggestion that every action can be evaluated based upon whether it increases or diminishes happiness. In your book, they go into considerable detail uh, about some of the early utilitarian philosophers who actually identified like seven different categories of experience that you could rate on a numerical basis based upon whether you know, positive numbers, they gave you, it gives you pleasure, you have pleasure in terms of a particular category, or pain is a negative number. And you add them all up and you decide, remember this is partly how do we make decisions, moral decisions. Based upon this utilitarian approach, you could say, okay, anything that when I, when I assign numbers, positive for, for pleasure, negative for pain, in these seven categories, and add it all up, if it's 15 or more, for instance, then that's a good thing. You know, if it's 14 or less, Bad thing. That's my moral calculator. There was a problem with that because, for one thing, the subjectivism we're bringing sort of you know it says that the principle here is that it is a a ethical naturalism which is part of moral objectivism. But in fact, if I'm basing it on the principle of pleasure or pain, most often. I'm the one deciding is this pleasurable, pleasurable or painful. Now I can, the, the reason this isn't under, the, under moral subjectivism is because supposedly we can apply this to others as well. I can evaluate for you, is this pleasurable or painful? Or for a culture, is this good or bad, pleasurable or painful? But quantifying moral values like that runs into some problems, okay? Now we're gonna spend a couple minutes Where'd Bob go? We're talking about Kant. He's a German. Um, Immanuel Kant, Kant's ethics. You will remember Immanuel Kant from previous conversations. Kant was a rationalist. He's the one that proposed reality is defined because inside our minds we have created a structure with certain values. It's almost like he's got this little grid system and every input we have in terms of sensory input or any or abstract thought or anything else fits in one of those categories. And the big overriding categories are space and time. But then he's got individual subjectivism, objectivism, and various others. And so to Kant, the big deal was what happens in your mind. He was an ultra-rationalist in that regard. Now Kant emphasized, the very German, emphasized duty that moral value is determined upon moral duty, completely apart from any consequences. Again, the example I'll throw out up front is Kant would say, we'll get to the category of here in a minute, Kant would say that, um, that if you can't universalize a moral decision so that everybody can practice it and you'll be okay with that, then you shouldn't do it. And since the example of the Nazis knocking on the door and you do you lie to them about there being Jews in your basement or you tell them the truth? Kant would have said you have to tell the truth because you can't universalize lying or else it would destroy all human veracity. And so he'd say absolutely, tell them the Jews are in the basement. Of course he was German. <laughs> 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 he, would have been, he would have been killed on the spot. Well, very possible. So, now, this relates to the fact that Kant believed that human rationality was the source of morality. That all moral values and moral thought come out of our rationality. And so the issue we have to deal with is within a proper rationality, how can we make moral decisions that retain a sense of goodwill, no matter what the consequences are? Goodwill meaning a consistency in our own rationality. He came up with, with the categorical imperative, and he's got several different versions of this, and the book goes into more detail. But the categorical, categorical imperative, now, categorical means you can't deny it, it's absolute. Imperative means this is an order. Okay, so he's saying this is an unavoidable commandment. He said that one should never will, or decide for, a course of action that would result in a contradiction of one's own will, 
or and that whoever abides by this principle has good will. German writer. He's saying you have to be consistent in the way you think about things. And as long as you're consistent in how you think about things, you're acting in good will. He actually expanded on this, I'm sure because his, you know, his friend said, Emmy, what? <laughs> yeah. um, he further said, act only according to that maxim by which you can at the same time will that it should be universal law. All right? That he thought that was what was a rational moral decision. In other words, can you universalize this rule of action or the reverse of it and be okay with that? Well, in other words, what would happen if everybody did what you are planning to do? If everybody lied about everything. Okay? Or if everybody stole. How would you like that? Or if everybody killed. He says that rationally the proper moral decision is based upon your ability to, to be consistent in your thinking, and that is defined by can you universalize this and be okay with it. There's some reason behind that, except it just breaks down when you get to issues of conflict, you know, like truth telling versus saving a life. Very cerebral and not to the heart. That's Immanuel Kant. Yeah. I mean, his, his two books, two most famous books, he wrote a lot of them, were Critique of Pure Reason, is the book that he created, he, he outlined his view of how human rationality works in terms of our perception of reality. That's the, you know, the categories in our mind. And then he wrote another book called Critique of Practical Reason. This is the practical reason part. How, what you do with it. A couple of other examples of ethical naturalism, rule utilitarianism, utilitarianism proposes that we should focus entirely on the consequences, but not the consequences of individual acts, but the consequences of general moral rules. So rule utilitarianism says what rules of morality work versus act utilitarianism says what individual acts work in terms of the consequences being most satisfying. But the fact is that rule utilitarianism sort of just cheats the whole question and goes back to the idea that, well, what if you've got two moral rules that conflict with each other? It doesn't help us decide between them, so it doesn't really give us an ethical theory we can work with, right? Um, we then have, and this is one of the most important, the most valuable modern approaches, I'm really skimming this stuff, folks, because there's too much here, virtue ethics, the C.S. Lewis conference I just went to, was about virtues in the 21st century. And we talked a lot at that conference about the intellectual virtues, which are traditional, starting with Aristotle, and then the moral virtues. The three most important moral virtues are faith, hope, and love, the biblical virtues. So virtue ethics goes back to the much more ancient focus, and this does go back to the Greeks, some of the Greeks, who said the way to make moral decisions is by making sure you're a good person that you have sufficiently high quality character that you're equipped to make those decisions. And if you are, if you have good character, if you have been taught and have developed the virtues of a good character, then you will make good decisions virtuously. And this is one of the most popular and up and coming approaches. Again, it's one of the most ancient. It was gone for a long time and it's now come back. People are talking a lot about virtue ethics now. They do talk about first intellectual virtues. The best way to understand that is those are the virtues that can be taught. You can teach generosity. You can teach courage. You can teach temperance. You can teach fidelity. You know, those are all principles that you, you, know, you can teach your children. But then the other kind of virtue are the moral virtues, those that can only be developed through practice. Love, you can't teach somebody to love. They have to learn to do that by doing that. Faith, you can describe it, but you can't teach it. Hope, you, can, you can't teach it. You only develop, you know, and that's why if, we, if we'll make the effort to have a little faith, it will grow. To have a little hope, it will increase. To show a little love, and it will become more natural and become more love. And this, this goes back to Aquinas and others, that virtues almost always lie midway between two vices. Generosity, for instance, is midway between 
greed and selfishness, and profligacy, where you just give everything away willy-nilly and you know don't think about the consequences. Example. Okay. Temperance is halfway between drunkenness and you know being an insufferable uh, temperance person. You know, or somebody who takes an axe to a bar like Harry Nation did. In other words, it's never permissible to take a drink of any kind. Well, properly defined, temperance is a value that's midway between those two things. Right? So this virtue ethics, and I could spend a lot more time talking about that, maybe someday I will, really is, from a Christian perspective, the scripture talks a lot about developing our character, a godly character. And so the idea here is while there are no hard and fast rules, I can't say, okay, here are the five moral decisions that you should make today. I can say, here's a way that, according to scripture, according to historic understanding, here's how you can grow your character in a virtuous way, so that you are equipped to make the right decisions, moral decisions. Fair? Mm -hmm. There then is an aspect of ethical, uh, we're, we're moving now to ethical non-naturalism. All the previous ones say there's something built into us that does that. Okay, when we talk about virtue ethics, there's, there's a Christian version of that that's based upon a non-natural belief in God's morality and all of that. We'll talk about you know, divine command uh, in a minute. But the principle is that virtue, since it goes all the way back to Aristotle and before, that those are things that are in us if we will encourage them. Or that we can't put them in us. Still, it's a natural thing. But natural law ethics is the first version of non-naturalism we'll talk about. This defines human good and therefore moral good in terms of the ultimate purpose of a human being. Both Augustine and Aquinas, who are the greatest theologians of this church, advocated natural law ethics. Both of them were very big on natural law. Natural law, in, in, like natural theology, means being able to determine by use of our reason and our observation of the natural world what God desires. And we can see God in his creation, for instance. So they would say that Human good is in terms of our ultimate purpose, and because God made us as rational beings, both Augustine and Aquinas were big on us using our rationality, God made us rational beings, we have the ability to use our rationality to perceive prescriptive laws that are the moral norms. Descriptive laws just describe how things are. The sciences like, you know, um, geology and all of that, all of those sciences are descriptive. They are, they are giving a picture of what the world's like. Prescriptive means they are telling us how we should be. Okay? They're giving instructions. So the prescriptive laws of the moral norms, Aquinas, Augustine, others have said that God has equipped us, has built us, so that we can see what is morally true and good. That the moral, the, the Important moral truths are evident to us, are self-evident to us, if we choose to be aware. A lot of people have blinded themselves. But Augustine Aquinas and others have said that if we're paying attention, God gives us the ability to see what is right and wrong, what is morally true and morally not true. Now, consistent with that, Aquinas proposed that in the event that we have an apparent conflict of moral truths, which is our dilemma after all, we've got moral truths that seem to be in conflict with each other, and if you've got two, two appear, a decision has to be made in which there appear to be both good and evil results possible, how do you decide? The analogy that's using, you, used is a man whose son has visited him and he is the keeper of a drawbridge. And there's a train coming. And he has to lower the train, the bridge, in order for the train to cross or all the people on that train are going to die. Well, he discovers at the last possible moment that his son is playing in the gears. And he knows if he throws that switch to save all the people on that train, his son's going to die because it will grind him up. Either decision he makes, there's going to be a good consequence and a bad consequence, a good and an evil. So how do you decide? Okay? And why this um, proposed in his principle of double effect that first, the evil consequence cannot be directly intended. The man certainly doesn't intend either for the train to crash or for a son to die. In other words, we can't decide, okay, I'm going to do this evil thing on purpose because there might be a positive good. That doesn't fly. 
you can't make an intentional decision to do evil in the hopes that it will result in something good, or you violate the principle. Secondly, the evil consequence is not the direct means of producing the good effect. It's not because his son is going to be ground up in the gears that the people on the train are going to be saved. It is a resultant consequence, not a direct cause. In other words, the idea of sacrificing someone's life maliciously, intentionally, you know, by taking him and throwing him into the gears in order to save the train, that's not liable. It has to be something that's a consequence you can't control. And third, there must be a proportionate reason to perform the act despite the evil consequences. That there is a good result if I make a decision that will cause one bad thing or evil thing to happen. And so he's giving us a guideline which says, and in this case, all of these things are, are all of these criteria are met by the case of the guy with the, you know, the drawbridge and his son playing in the gears. He still has a choice to make. And Aquinas would probably have said at that point, if all of these criteria are met, then you would probably have to decide based upon the greater good. Some fathers would save their son. Many would sacrifice their son in order to save 350 people. Carolyn? That doesn't help you with the Nazis knocking on the door in line, though, right? Because um, of number two? Because the evil consequence is the means, right? Um, or no, no, it's not the evil consequence, it's the evil act. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, he's talking here about a direct consequence. You know, they, they, what the Nazis would do if you, know, if you didn't lie to them would be an indirect consequence. You didn't actually do it. Mm -hmm. you, you didn't prevent them from doing it. Yeah, I was thinking okay. it was the lying that was the issue. The evil um, consequence, though, is not the evil yeah, act. Exactly. Mm -hmm. All right. They would be deceived, I guess, as the consequence. I'm very confused. <laughs> so, so here's my question. Okay. Um, uh, Nero, was it Nero that uh, commanded all the two-year-olds and under to be put to death? Herod. And yet, and yet uh, an angel approached uh, uh, Joseph and Mary's and Jesus, and they had him moved to Egypt while right. the other children all died. So where does that fall in, in category with what we're talking about right now? Well, they were not called on to make a moral choice. We're talking about making moral choices. The only one who made a moral choice there, and it was an evil choice, was Herod. Uh, but it's God, not as, it's not as though... Why not have saved the rest of the, the children? Well, we're getting into an issue of what's right for God to do, which is a completely different issue than the philosophy of ethics where we talk about how do we make decisions. If, if uh, Joseph and Mary had been told, if you run away now, then Jesus will be saved, but if you stay here, all the children will be saved, but Jesus will die, then that would have been a moral, ethical question. All right, and they would have had to have answered that. But the issue of, you know, these principles don't apply. To God. But we're made in God's likeness. But these don't apply to God. We're talking about human moral decision making. We can't say God is is immoral. is more well that that He is subject to our moral determinations. But we're supposed to be subject to His. Absolutely, because He's God, and we're not. So is there not an answer in that in 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 the context of how He saved Jesus for? For a down the road future and, and the children who had to die? I mean, is there no, a because those are not consequent to one another. The children didn't, you know, Herod decided to kill the children. The fact that Jesus and was. Jesus. No, but the fact that Jesus was not killed is not a cause of the fact that the children were killed. Okay, we need to move on. But the biggest point about what you're saying is we can't. Not take our moral criteria of decision making and apply it to God. That's a completely different set. You have to go back to the philosophy of religion discussion about the nature of God on that. Okay? So they're not Pardon? related? No, they're not. Yes? We need to pay attention. Um, we let ourselves get led into a situation and then we have a consequence. If the guy had kept an eye on his kid, he wouldn't have been playing in here. Right. And if he hadn't been screwed around with everybody, he wouldn't be pregnant, he wouldn't have to worry about having a baby. If you hadn't let the poor Jewish people hide in your basement, if you just said, look, they'll come and they'll kill me too. I can't <laughs> take you in because I'm going to have serious consequences. Mm -hmm. You know, but we don't pay attention. Okay, do you not see that that's a moral decision? That my life, yeah. 
My life must be preserved at the cost of yours. Right. Well, that's again, it's, but you, you won't lose your life and theirs. Okay. Um, Anne Frank's family, Anne Frank died in the concentration camp because her parents and she supported this. Yeah. We're involved in hiding Jews. Yeah. You know, you saw Schindler's List. I mean, the idea is that is the moral decision. We can't say that we shouldn't have a moral a moral conflict because if we had let the Jews be there in the first place, then there wouldn't have been a problem with us lying about it. Well, then you have made a moral decision prior yeah. to no, that yes. conflict. Yes. Uh, and I'm again, not, I'm, I'm not saying I'm against hiding in your basement, but you know, you leave the country too. There's many, right. many other solutions, but we go too far and then we're trapped. Right, and that's true, but for the sake of our conversation, I mean, you can say, well, um, a woman is not married and she's pregnant, does she get an abortion? We can say, well, if she hadn't been messing around in the first place, she wouldn't have this problem. That's all well and good, but that does not, that does not address the ethical problem in front of us, which is given the circumstances here now, she is pregnant, she is single, does she, you know, what process does she go about to make the decision to have an abortion or not? You can't back up in time and say, yeah, but the answer to it, you know, was back there. Every one of the moral decisions we make, the circumstances that led to it, become irrelevant when we are confronted with the actual decision. And so we're talking about how we, and, and yeah, I mean, we can say as a matter of principle, well, don't go there, and then you won't have a problem. Sure. But that doesn't solve the problem that when, it, when it's presented to us as a real ethical decision problem. It behooves us who have morals to teach those morals to people before we Absolutely. Get into the problems. That's virtue ethics. But, You're advocating virtue ethics, and we teach, we teach that. Yes. But there aren't always bad reasons, for example, rape. You can be exactly. pregnant because of rape, and, and there's blaming the victim is not going to help. No, exactly. And, and you know, somebody who's married and she's pregnant and then her husband runs off with somebody else and she's a single mother in a culture that doesn't accept single mothers, what does she do? It's not her fault. Yeah. So, yeah, in, but in every case, the there is a moral, moral determination that must be made in front of us right now, whatever the cause was. You know, the, the, the prior cause, um, really is not the issue, but rather how do we deal with moral questions that confront us. Chris? Okay, according to Aquinas on this thing and the guy with the kid on the thing, yeah. if you follow this, then, well, I'm just trying to figure out, is there a right decision? I mean, in other words, you think, okay, well, on all of that, there's 300 people and there's a kid, the son's gonna die. That seems to be, would be the correct decision, and I'm assuming that that's, I mean, that's what I would think. But is there a question to that? I mean. Or is it well, just it's a moral decision and it's going to be the guy making the decision and he basically... Th this is decision. like a decision tree. Absolutely. And the idea is, if if the guy had looked at it and said the evil consequence is not directly intended, if the guy was saying that for whatever reason, and I can't imagine how this would be the case, that if I take my son and I throw him into these gears so that he dies, then the train will be saved. Right. Aquinas' argument says, no, you can't do that. Because that would be an intentional act of evil killing your son, and even though there's a greater good to be had out of it by saving all those people, that's not okay. So what Aquinas is, Aquinas is giving us is a checklist to say, let's make sure that we've covered all the considerations before we reach the point where we have to make the decision, because that, that the decision may be made for you if these things aren't all, don't all hold. And again, the example being, if I throw my son, if I throw my son in the gears, for some reason, the train will be safe. No, that's not acceptable. You can't do an act of evil in order for there to be, but for an evil consequence to occur outside your control, then that does that's not a deal breaker. Okay. All right, let's move on. We have spent a lot of time with that. Let's talk for a few minutes about divine command theory. The moral standard in divine, divine command theory is determined by God's command. And the principle here is that God's commands impose obligations on us because, one, God created, He sustains, and He owns the whole universe, including us. He's the boss. And rightly so. But secondly, that we are beneficiaries of His benevolence, and beneficiaries should rightly be obligated to the benefactor. So this is the argument for why we should be obedient to God's commands if you hold to divine command theory. Now we can go further. In fact, I was as I was reading this section of the book the first time, and they get into the argument about, well, but there's a there's a paradox here because are the moral truths morally right because God said so, 
or does God say things that are morally true? In other words, are they morally true apart from God, and he simply has communicated that to us? And from that point of view, the argument is made that, that there's a defeater in there. You know, that, that, that can't work. Well, I'm reading this, and I, I'm right. I made a note, and I said, the moral values are not based upon, you know, they were not either pre-existent before God, and he simply told us about them, nor did he tell us about them, and therefore they became good. They are reflections of God's moral character. And I turned the page, and then the book said that. I went, <laughs> okay. That for a Christian, for a theist, we would say that it is the nature of God as a moral being that identifies our responsibility to be obedient to his moral directives. Not just because he said so, although that should be enough, but rather because those moral, those moral commands or instructions are based upon the moral nature of God, who is God. The book so, just doesn't say enough. It just kind of rushes over this. That was my feeling. Yeah, it does say it, though. You know, it, it does, but it's weak. It, it, compared to all the other content, this should be strong. Yeah. <laughs> I agree, but then again, we believe that God is a you know is a moral God. Um, God Himself is the moral standard. What we do is not just based upon the fact that God you know morally it's not just based upon the fact that God said so, but because of His nature, that He is moral perfection Himself. Now, as a conclusion to ethics, we must reject ethical relativism. The idea that ethics are entirely based upon your culture or what you want or what your emotions say or, you know, any of those kinds of things or, or the um, ethical egoism of Ayn Rand or whatever. But we still have to acknowledge that there are some valid elements that, that we see in cultural relativism, in subjectivism, and motivism. Cultural relativism, if we're going to be culturally sensitive, we have to recognize that there are differences. There are cultural differences that we, in fact, you know, contextualization is the word that we use in, in missiology, in Christian missions, when we talk about an ability to understand and, and relate to the particulars of a, a different culture. Well, that cultural sensitivity is something that is, doesn't go as far as cultural relativism, but we do need to recognize that there are legitimate differences in cultures and that that's important for us. The same thing in that how people feel about stuff makes a difference. It may not be the ultimate difference, but it does make a difference, and we have to pay attention to that. And the idea that people have emotional responses to things, yeah, there's some validity to that. But ultimately, as Christians, we must affirm a version of moral uh, objectivism, especially as represented in divine command theory, with the emphasis being on morality based on the moral character of God, not just his commands, but the fact that he is himself the epitome of morality. And that we are, we are moral because we're made in his image. Okay? Any questions about ethics? Because in 10 minutes, we're going to know everything about beauty. <laughs> John? I'd like to just make a comment. Uh, we started this class with two questions. You answered one, and the other one was just kind of like that. Uh, which one did I, did I not answer? The first one was, is there such thing as moral truth? And that was, that was well answered. Right. That's correct. But how do you decide? How do you decide between moral dilemmas? Okay. And I just wish I'd be satisfied with just the index of all this information in your brain. Rather than, I mean, I yeah. mean, you are a walking encyclopedia and all this. But I doubt. Hey, anybody, I read the book. That's all. Uh. <laughs> um, I doubt anybody here follows Aquinas's three steps in determining right. what is the right decision. So, well, well, let, me there finish. let me finish. Oh, sure. And I would suggest that as Christians, Jesus made it exceptionally simple by walking in the Holy Spirit and learning to recognize Him and to follow His leading. I know that may sound simplistic to some people, but I find in a day of moral relativism, which is more to me in the world than anything other other point of view, I find that exceptionally comforting to know that I can trust him to, to lead me in these really critical decisions and to be comfortable with those decisions when I have one camp that says this is not right, or this is right, that's right. right. So that's very helpful to me. And, and in choosing between moral dilemmas, I would I would uh, 
I would suggest that if we come to that place where we learn to trust in the Holy Spirit who leads us in all truth. Well, I would agree with that. And this comes back to what we've said, that sort of the divine command theory, that based upon the morality of God, our relationship with God, our learning of God, our virtue ethics comes into that because there is a very strong Christian aspect of virtue ethics. The difficulty, and I agree with the principle that the Holy Spirit should guide us, that should be your guiding line. Obviously, I can't disagree with that, but I know people who claim to be guided by the Holy Spirit who do horrible things. Well, let me clarify what I'm saying. Okay, I need for you to stop because I have to get through this stuff. Very quickly, say what you need to say very quickly because I've got to get through the rest of this, okay? I'm sorry, I don't mean to cut you off, but I, you know, I struggle between wanting to give everybody an opportunity to talk and needing to try to These, these are subjects that deserve conversation. They do, they do. I don't disagree with that. But again, I think that it's both and. We need to take the guidance of the Holy Spirit with humility, and we need to understand that there are things that we can't... God gave us rationality. God gave us the ability to use our minds. God gave us great learning from people who are godly people, and we can apply those things in ways that make it a more reasonable process. Again, Christians have done, claiming to be guided by the Holy Spirit, horrendous things down through history. I'm not blaming the Holy Spirit, I'm blaming people's inability to see and hear correctly. Okay, so I don't, I completely agree with what you're saying, but there's a built-in problem with that unless we also have other sort of safeguards that I think God has given us. I'm not going to take any other questions, I'm going to go through this question. question. Okay. my words are that. We study in the other classes of science. Right. But we've left totally missing in the whole question of ethics, the matter of economics. That's, that's my statement. The matter of economics, okay. The subject of economics. We've dealt with science, we're the dealing, knowledge, etc. on economics. Now, in, in both missed. cases, we're dealing with the theory behind it, the philosophical theory behind it. What you're talking about, if you're talking about economics in terms of equity in economics? Economic theory has is, is been brushed aside. And okay. it has a big impact on our values and our decision-making, our morals and economics. That's an application question. I don't disagree with what you're saying, but you know, in this length of course, we can't deal with all of the different yeah, exactly. areas of application. Sure. Okay. We skipped politics too. You know, that was just a huge thing. All right. I'm going to go through this very quickly. The philosophy of ethics. The question is: Is beauty simply a matter of personal opinion, or is beauty a real quality that exists in some things and not others, no matter what individual people think? Is beauty objective? or subjective. First, we have to acknowledge the fact, and as Christians we especially see this, human beings have an inherent desire to make, appreciate, and enjoy beautiful things. They always have. How many of you don't have a single painting or piece of art in your house? Obviously, every one of you do. Sometimes, something that you believe is beautiful. A great statement from, from the, uh, the craftsman period said, do not, do not own anything that you do not um, believed to be useful, or believed to be beautiful, or known to be useful. Because beauty is important to us. But what is art? What, how do we decide what's beautiful? Do we accept the artist who, who as a work of art, um, he did a, a, a plastic crucifix of Jesus hanging in a glass of his own urine. It was called His Christ. It led to riots, and it was destroyed, and he redid it and sold it. Um, is that art? Okay. I mean, people's re repulsion of that. Some people would say, well, yeah, it's art. Okay. What is art? Is art any human made object? Is the back stretcher I have next on my desk? You know, this is the example that the book uses. Is that art? You know? Um, probably not. Is art anything that's presented as art, the institutional theory? If it's recognized by artists and by gallery owners as art, well, his Christ was recognized as art. It was, it was shown in galleries. Do we accept that? No. Is it the, uh, the product of the artistic process? And if so, what does artistic process mean? What is the nature of intentionality about Is art whatever brings or tends to bring aesthetic pleasure to those who ex uh, experience the object? This is the paradigm case approach. And there's some real validity to this because what it does is it starts with the art, objects of art. It looks at, you know, um, Michelangelo's David or, you know, Da Vinci's uh, self-portraits or, you know, um, the Brandenburg concertos or something else and looks at those and goes, yeah, that's art. Because we have an aesthetic experience or pleasure that we derive from those things. Well, some people derive aesthetic pleasure from things that other people would say are not art. So that breaks down. 
Is art the human-made objects that are created to be enjoyed for their beauty? What about accidental beauty that we consider to be art? The, just the Nautilus shell, you know, the, the, the Nautilus shell, all the different chambers in order. I, I know a lot of people who have a graphic of that hanging up. Oh, is that art? It's, there's not an intentionality of creativity in that. And yet there are some things that are truly beautiful and that people perceive as being artistic that weren't intended to be. Or is human-made objects that are enjoyable for their beauty? Forget the creative process, whether it was intentional or not, just people made it and we find it beautiful. We enjoy them for that. So there are lots of ways to think about art. Like science, it's very hard to define. So we then say, what is art is hard to define. Then what is the function or the purpose of art? What is it for? We have some, several different theories. Mimesis is art as imitation. This is the traditional version. Artists used to be trained by, they would take a large canvas by a master and they would put a string grid over it and say, Ross, this is your square. Reproduce that perfectly. And keep doing it until you get it right. The idea of imitation. Portraiture is an example of that, where we imitate something in real life or a landscape or whatever. So mimesis, art as imitation, is one understanding of the purpose of art, that we imitate beauty in order to extend it in effect. This beautiful landscape I have, I'm going to paint it so that I can take it back and see it in my house whenever I want. Or is it expressionism, art as an expression of emotion? I feel this strongly. I was moved to write this piece of music. You know, this poem tells you how I felt when I was really, you know, really in love. Expression of emotion. Formalism, that is, art is significant form. Is there some form that great art takes, like a concerto or like one of you know, the Dutch masters or whatever? The idea that art needs to meet certain format kind of things in order to be considered, that that's the purpose of art, is to, is to fulfill one of those kinds of standards. The idea, Marxism maintains that art is an ideology and that it's for political power. Some of the poster stuff that, that, that Marxism and socialism, like in Cuba and elsewhere, have done are extraordinary pieces of art. And so Marx maintained that art was for the purpose of convincing people, especially convincing them ideologically, to agree with, with Marxism. Or is it Christian ethics is the function? That is the imago Dei. Imago Dei means the image of God. And we are made in God's image. God is a creative God, therefore we are creative. And, as Nicholas Waltersdorf, who has written a lot on, as a Christian, on art, that we are involved in world projection, which means every time we create a piece of art, we in effect are sort of imitating God in creating something and projecting our little piece of the world in the same way God created. Right? And then we do that for appreciation, for us to appreciate it, for others to appreciate it. I think there's wisdom in affirming that there is an eclectic Christian view of art in its function. There's a lot of different ideas that are legitimate. Just like ethics and so many other things, there's two approaches to aesthetics, the question of what is beauty. There is aesthetic subjectivism that says that beauty really is in the eye of the beholder, that there's no objective quality to beauty, so no piece of art is superior than the other. We really believe that, that no piece of art is better than the other. If you really believe that art is subjective, then I can say this is a better piece of art to me than that one, but I can't tell you that that's true because you have to decide for yourself. This is related to moral subjectivism, the idea that it's entirely up to me. What's right is what I think is right, that's moral subjectivism. What is beautiful is what I think is beautiful, that is aesthetic subjectivism. Those two things grew up together in the 20th century. They're really quite new in that regard. Or um, aesthetic objectivism, there is an objective quality to beauty, which is why great works of art are almost universally recognized as such. That, yeah, there is some disagreement down, you know, down the tiers, but at the highest level, we all listen to Mozart or Bach, even if we're not a classical music fan, and we go, wow, okay. Or we look at Michelangelo or whatever, and we say, yeah, that's what art's supposed to be about. My brother says there's never been any real artist other than Norman Rockwell. <laughs> But what is the nature, if there is aesthetic objectivism, what is the nature of these objective standards? I've only got two more slides. These, th there are three ways to see this. Aestheticism is the idea that art and the artist are not, this is the relationship between art and ethics. 
that art and the artist are not susceptible to moral evaluation or judgment. You can't say, you shouldn't have done that, or that's bad, or that's wrong, or that's not good art. That art, by definition, is outside any moral. So Piss Christ is, you can't, you can't complain about that or criticize it, because it's a work of art, according to the artist. Um, in Seattle, we have the EMP building, you know, which is, um, I really don't care for. It's, it's actually an architectural result of the philosophical view um, of there being no, reality, no meaning in the world. Okay. And you see it because there's no straight lines, there's nothing that connects. It's like a giant pile of crumpled colored foil. And to some people, it's one of the most beautiful buildings in the world. Okay. They would say, you don't have a right to say that you don't like it. You know. Moralism is another view of the belief that art is wholly subservient to ethics. It's the reverse. That art has to serve an ethical purpose if it's going to be good art. Tolstoy was a huge advocate of this. The book talks about that. He actually looked at what we would consider some classical works of art and said they are insufficient in declaring a proper moral stance according to what society finds moral, and so therefore they are not real art. Okay, so no morality can be considered in art. Morality is the primary consideration in art or ethicism, which says that moral attributes in art are relevant, but they're not wholly determinative of aesthetic value. Which is, you know, where I'm coming from. The concert, I mentioned the, the, guy, the concert from uh, the fellow who was talking about the Palestinians. He's, he said some wonderful things in this concert. He said, for instance, that every once in a while, um, he's a Christian, but he said every once in a while, a Christian will say, God gave me this song. And then they play the song, and, and, and Martin said, and then I understand why God didn't want to keep it. <laughs> <laughs> and he said to him, to say music is Christian music or not Christian music is like going to a beautiful tree and saying, are you a Christian tree or a not Christian tree? But there is beauty or there's not. And then God is the source of all beauty. In fact, that is the Christian aesthetic view, in effect. God has shown aesthetic concerns. He created the world. And at the end of each day, he said, and God looked at what he made, and he said, it is good. There's a qualitative value there. God gave us color. He gave us food that tastes good. He gave us music that is beautiful. Not all music is beautiful. Mark Twain said, Wagner's music is better than it sounds. <laughs> um, so, but the idea is that God has clearly demonstrated in his creation from the very first, in Genesis 1, that he is concerned about aesthetic values. God is still the source of all beauty. Of all, every flower that grows, every, you know, everything of beauty that occurs, every new color they invent. Have you seen some of the jockey clothes people wear? Yeah. Nobody's going to miss them. Okay. Um, God is still involved in creating beauty. He is the source, in fact, of all beauty. And God's nature is as a beautiful being. He's not only a moral being, and therefore the source of all moral determination, but he is a beautiful being, and therefore is the source and foundation of all beauty. And that's where I think we look. Okay? That, to me, is, an, is the appropriate Christian philosophy or aesthetic, um, philosophy of aesthetics. Questions about that? Seven minutes over. I'm sorry that the aesthetics got sort of a short shrift, but I thought ethics was something that has been looked at.